Hello, and welcome to the Clinical Liver Diseases video series. CLD is an official digital learning publication of the AASLD. I'm Joseph Toth, PGY2 internal medicine resident at UCSD and the author of Portal Vein Thrombosis, Before, During, and After Liver Transplant. I'd like to provide a comment, commentary to supplement our paper. The diagnosis of PVT is a radiographical diagnosis with the gold standard being Doppler ultrasound with cross-sectional imaging generally used as a confirmatory modality. In some instances, contrasted MRI can be used to evaluate the flow within the portal venous system with the goal of identifying if a cavernoma is present. Once a diagnosis of PVT has been made, there is no recommendation at this time to pursue a hypercoagulability workup. While these hypercoagulable risk factors can be more commonly seen in patients with cirrhosis, who then go on to develop PVT, it is the changes in portal venous flow that likely provoke PVT formation. In order to answer the question on how hepatologists should approach the management of PVT, we have designed an algorithm. This will be especially useful for the hepatologist who is caring for a patient with cirrhosis with PVT before, during, and after liver transplant evaluation. Our diagram begins with determining if the PVT is acute versus chronic. If it is acute, the next question is to determine if the patient is a liver transplant candidate. Liver transplant candidates with acute PVT should undergo screening for varices. If high-risk varices are present, then patients should undergo TIPS with thrombectomy. If varices are successfully eradicated after TIPS, then the hepatologist should start anticoagulation. If low-risk varices are present, then anticoagulation should be started immediately to prevent progression of PVT. Note that acute PVTs are significantly less common than chronic PVTs in patients with cirrhosis. On the other hand, the management of chronic PVTs is different in patients who are a liver transplant candidate. After a diagnosis of chronic PVT, screening endoscopy should be performed, and patients with high-risk varices should undergo TIPS. If varices are eliminated after TIPS, then anticoagulation should be started. In patients who are liver transplant candidates with chronic PVT who have a low-risk varice, Anticoagulation should be started and imaging follow-up should be done every three to six months with CT or MRI. If the PVT stabilizes or improves with anticoagulation, then this treatment should be continued. However, if the PVT progresses, then TIPS or thrombectomy should be considered. Now, the reason to anticoagulate patients with PVT for a liver transplant candidate is to minimize the complications post-liver transplantation. Some studies have illustrated that post-liver transplant patients who had a PVT are at a 4 to 39% increased risk of PVT redevelopment. Additional studies indicate that the rate of one-year mortality is greater for patients with prior PVT at 13.5% as compared to 9.9% for patients without PVT after liver transplantation. Furthermore, Patients with preoperative PVT, grade three and four, have an increased risk of developing post-transplant PVT. Thus, initiation of prophylactic anticoagulation should be carefully considered before liver transplant. These findings illustrate the critical nature of PVT treatment in liver transplant candidates to improve their long-term mortality and morbidity. Importantly, PVT used to be a significant barrier for patients who are seeking liver transplantation. As time has progressed in patients with PVT who have close follow-up and appropriate treatments, patients can have similar mortality and graft survival outcomes to their non-PVT peers. On behalf of all of us on the CLD team, I hope you found this video describing the management of PVT and liver transplant patients useful. For more information about PVT, please visit us at www.cldlearning.com. Thank you for watching.